In this video series, I'm going to talk about fluids that are either at rest or they're moving in a way such that if you had fluid layers in here, the particles in those layers adjacent to each other won't be able to move. So there's no relative motion between the fluid layers. And what that means is that there's not going to be any shear stresses in the fluid. So the fluid can move. So if it's moving in this reservoir that has a free surface. So the fluid will be able to move into the other reservoir, but no shearing stresses are present in the fluid. So we are neglecting those. That's why it's called fluid statics, because we're looking at fluids that are static. And because over here, the fluid layers, we're assuming that these fluid layers are actually not moving. But the fluid as a bulk, as a whole, this fluid is definitely moving. So that means that the object can, or the fluid can move as a bulk, so it can have an acceleration as well. Okay. We do this because it makes our analysis easier. And because our concern is to investigate pressure and how it varies throughout a fluid. So pressure, that is something we already know that it is a normal force per unit area. But what we don't know is that if we were to apply, let's say, a force onto this point, this would generate a pressure if this is within a fluid. Or if we were to apply a force from this direction or some other direction, would that mean that the pressure would remain the same or not? That is what we're going to look at in this video. That if the orientation of the force changes, does that mean that the pressure is going to change as well? That is the question that we have to answer. And, and in order to do that, let's just look at this fluid that is within a container. We take a small fluid element out of it. And this fluid element now, it's wedge-shaped, a triangular wedge. I'll talk about why we've chosen a triangular wedge after we've analyzed this. So this triangular wedge in X carries out in X direction, in Y direction, and in Z direction as well. And because it's a small differential fluid element, so that's why the X dimension is a delta X or DX, the Y dimension is delta Y, and Z dimension is delta Z. And then this slanted dimension is delta S. So now we're going to look at the forces that are being that are acting on this fluid element. First of all, the force that is acting on this area. We already know that force is equal to pressure into area because pressure is force by area. So the force that is going to act in this direction on this face of the fluid element. Let's call that PS. And because force is equal to pressure into area, so pressure into area, area is going to be, area of this face is going to be delta X into delta S. Okay, so now we look at the Y direction. In the Y direction, we've got this face. So Pressure is acting on this face because its pressure is a normal force per area. That's why it's acting in this direction. And this force is going to be, because it's in y direction, so let's call it PY. And the area is going to be, this dimension is delta x. So it's going to be delta x into delta z. And now in the Z direction, you've got this fluid face. And in this direction, we're going to have, because it's acting in the Z direction, so the pressure is going to be PZ into area, which is going to be delta Y into delta X. Okay, or I can write it delta X into delta Y. 
So these are the pressure forces that act on this fluid element. We've already said that the uh, shear stresses are going to be neglected. And other than that, um, the external force that is left is the weight of the fluid element. And the weight of the fluid element, this is a straight arrow. Uh, okay. So the weight of the fluid element, weight we know is equal to mg. And the mass, because we we're talking about a fluid, so then we have to take into account density, and density is mass by volume. Okay. So I can substitute mass over here as density into volume, or density into g into volume. And rho g is specific weight. It's represented by gamma. So it's going to be gamma into volume. And what is the volume of this fluid element? Imagine if this was a rectangular or a cubical uh, fluid element, then the volume would have been delta x into delta y into delta z. But because this is half of that, it's a wedge. So the volume for a wedge is delta x delta y delta z divided by 2. So delta x, delta y, delta z, divided by 2. And I'm just going to write that over here as well. And now that I have all the forces that are acting on this fluid element, the external forces, I've accounted for them. I'm not going to show the forces that are acting in the x direction because that's just going to make this entire thing a bit too messy. So from Newton's second law, which is F equals MA, I can apply that on this fluid element. And because this is a vector, so that means I can look at the forces that are acting in the x uh, direction, in the y direction, or in the z direction. So I'm just going to look at the forces that are acting in the y direction first. So the sum of forces in y direction is going to be equal to m into a y. So what are the forces that are acting in y direction? This is the y direction. This is one of the forces. And then the second one is this force that is acting in a way such that it makes a theta angle. This can have two components. It can have a vertical component and it can have a horizontal component. So it can have one component that is going to be, let's say, one component in this direction and the other component that is in this direction. And the component that is in this direction is going to be PS into delta X into delta s sine theta. So then I can write the left-hand side of the equation as the first term, which is this force, py into delta x into delta z, minus, because this has a negative direction, ps into delta x into delta s sine of theta. And that's going to be equal to ma and mass, I can substitute that and write, instead of mass, I can write rho v. And the volume we already discussed is this term. So it can be rho into delta x, delta y, delta z by 2 into a y. Okay. So this is forces in y direction. Now we could do the same for forces in z direction, which is this direction. And in the z direction, I've got pz delta x delta y, and then the vertical component of this force, which is going to be ps delta x delta s cos of theta. And this is in the negative direction, so it's going to have a negative sign with it. And the weight component as well, minus gamma into delta x, delta y, delta z by 2. And all of that is going to be equal to 
rho into volume into acceleration in the z direction. Now from simple geometry, what I can see is that I've got this delta s over here, which is this side. So if I was to take its components, the horizontal component of that is going to be equal to delta y, right? Because this is delta y. And the vertical component of that is going to be equal to delta z. So what does that mean? That delta z is equal to delta s sine of theta. Because right now we are looking at this component of delta s. Okay. And delta x is going to be equal to Oh, sorry, delta y. Delta y here is going to be equal to delta s cos of theta. Okay. So from this information now, what I can do is that I can plug it in here. So I can replace delta y by delta s cos theta. Over here as well, I can replace delta y by delta s cos theta. And over here as well, I can replace delta y by delta s cos theta. So now, in all of these terms, I'm going to have this as a common factor, delta s cos of theta. So, And then I've got delta x, which is also going to be a common factor because it's a part of every term. Delta x here, delta x here, in this term, and in this term as well. So that means that they can be cancelled out. And just like that in this equation, I can substitute delta z by delta s sine theta. I've got delta s sine theta already in this term. And again, delta z I can substitute delta s sine theta. Again, because now we will have delta s sine theta in all of the terms, so they can cancel out. And we've also got delta x now, which is also a common factor, which is a part of all of these terms. So that can go out as well. So I can simplify it and I can write both these terms. And once I cancel out all of these, I'm going to be left with this equation. And if I cancel out all of these in, the, in, in this equation, then I'm going to be left with this equation. Now because we said that we are interested in finding out the pressure at a point, so that means this fluid element is very very small and so small that delta x over here, delta y over here, and delta z over here are approaching zero you could say for it to become a point, right? So that means that delta z is approaching zero, delta y is approaching zero, and this term is going to go to zero. This is going to become zero as well. And I'm going to be left with, on this side, I'm going to be left with PZ is equal to PS and PY is equal to PS. And this is an important result because what this shows you is that if you were looking at pressure at a point, it doesn't matter what the direction is from which you're looking at or what the direction is from which you're applying the pressure. It's independent of the direction. So the pressure at a point in a fluid, whether it is at rest or whether it is in motion, it's independent of the direction as long as there are no shearing forces present. And this result is known as Pascal's law.